Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Japsurun Militanyena Tesmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Saraswati Devi Koravani Pracharine Nirvise Shashunyavadi Paschachadeshatarine Vancha Kaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bayevacha Patitanam Pavanebio Vaishnavibio Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Hatvaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So welcome everyone to our Bhakti Vai Bhav study of Srimad Bhagavatam and we're on the third canto on chapter one. We'd like to begin by asking devotees, maybe you can remember something we talked about in the last class. Just to refresh your mind, refresh refresh your memories. Do you remember anything from the class? Yes, Maras. Yes, Prabhu. Maharaj, you were discussing about the external energy, uh, like the material energy acting internally and externally both for Vidura and then you discussed many examples. Okay, very good. Yes, we talked, that was the important point, right? The external energy, Vidura saw the external energy, he saw Maya acting both internally and externally. Right? Maybe someone would like to tell us some examples of that. Once you were giving an example of how one devotee was doing book distribution and then he got uh, hit on the face just for showing a book. And then he told Tanki Krishna. So he converted external energy into internet. Energy. <laughs> okay, yes. Yeah. That, the one who hit him in the face, he was, a, he was going to hell. But the devotee who was distributing the books, he's going back to Godhead. So Maya was acting in both ways. Right? Anybody can remember any exam another example? Is there any example you can think of from the scriptures about this? How Maya acts? You can tell him, you can, we can convert, translate. Prabhu can Maharaj. So Prabhu wanted to speak in Hindi. Okay, yeah, somebody has to translate for me. Yes, Prabhu, an example was that you have a man who goes to the mandir, so his son asked him, why do you go to the mandir, you can see something. So the father said, I don't know, but the God can see you. Yes, Prabhu, you can see him. Prabhu was giving the example of the blind man going to the uh, temple and uh, uh, the son asked, why do you go to the temple when you cannot see? He said, I cannot see, but the Lord can see me. So he was remembering that example. Yeah, but that's not from scriptures. I wanted to hear something from scriptures. Like example of Pandavas is there, or how although they face so much difficulties, still they are always faithful to Krishna. And even the Kunti Marani also plays that like there will be more difficulties still because it gives us the opportunity to remember the lotus feet of Krishna. 
your Kunti Maharani's prayer, is it? Yes. That she prays to Krishna, let all these difficulties happen again and again, so that I might see you again and again. And seeing you means I no longer see birth and death. So Kunti Maharani, of course she had a lot of difficulties bringing up her five sons with no husband and the Kauravas were always trying to find some way to harm the, the Pandavas. So was, there was a lot of anxiety for Mother Kunti. But she saw Krishna in all of these difficulties. It helped her to come closer to Lord Krishna through all the difficulties. There's a nice example in the Srimad Bhagavatam. We have the example uh, about the The Brahmana from uh, Avanti Desh, and he was a rich man, and then he lost all of his money. And when he lost all of his money, then the family members rejected him because he was always miserly to them anyway. He was never very charitable, he was never kind. He was always harsh in speaking. He wasn't good to his family and to his servants. So when he lost all of this money, then they rejected him. And after they rejected him, he decided that he wanted to renounce the world. And he renounced everything and became like a mendicant. And so Krishna took away all of his wealth and when he was a mendicant, he would go and beg, and he would beg from people. People remembered him, and they would, they would be very nasty to him. And they would spit on him and do so many horrible things to him. But he tolerated all of this. He took shelter of the Lord in the heart. So he saw the mercy of Krishna. Like Krishna says, when I am very merciful to someone, then I take everything away from them. I take all their attachments away, all their material attachments. I take them away. And then in that helpless condition, then they surrender to me. So this Brahmana from Avant, he surrendered to Krishna. He lost all of his wealth. But he got the greatest wealth in the lotus feet of Krishna. And you see Dhruva Maharaj also. Dhruva Maharaj was hoping to get a kingdom. Initially he wanted a kingdom. But he got the Lord personally came and appeared before him. So he described how he was looking for he went to the forest looking for pieces of broken glass, but instead he found the most beautiful jewel. So like that. Maya works like that sometimes. Takes away the material things which, are, are not, which have no real value, which are very temporary and flickery. But Maya can also give us something very valuable, the most valuable thing. It can give us, it can bring us to the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. So these are some examples. And I, I talked about Prabhupada and Prabhupada's life, how it happened. And then you see also other Acharyas like Ramanuja Acharya. Ramanuja Charya, he, he was married and he had a wife. But his wife was always trouble. She was always doing bad things and she wasn't nice. They were supposed to be Vaishnavas and see everyone equally. But she would think, I'm high class, you're low class. I'm Brahmana, you're not Brahmana, and like that. So, it, so finally, Ramanuja just 
uh, tricked her and he sent a letter, said, oh, your father wants you to go home immediately. So she went home, she immediately, she rushed home to see her father and at that time Ramanuja went off and he took sannyas. So the difficulties were there, but it became an advantage for him to go to the Lord. He was trying to be, he was thinking initially to be married and be in householder life, but he saw it was difficult, it was not working for him. So he became a sannyasi and he took full shelter of the Lord. And then Lord Chaitanya, he also had problems. Students were, attacked, were going to attack him, they were going to beat him. He had been chanting the names of the gopis and some foolish student came to him and said, Oh, why you chant gopis? You should chant the name of Krishna. And so Lord Chaitanya was in the mood of the gopis and, he, and the, 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 in the mood of the gopis, the gopis were feeling some anger towards Krishna. So Lord Chaitanya became angry towards that student and he chased him. So then that student went and told all the other students and the, all the students were going to come, they were going to beat Lord Chaitanya. So then Lord Chaitanya was thinking about his mission, how he'd come in the world to deliver everyone. But if they were all going to turn against him and beat him, then how would he ever succeed? So he decided he had to take sannyas because when he takes sannyas, then they will all offer obeisances to him and they will respect him. So like that, Maya arranges these kind of things for us and we have to see the hand of Krishna in everything. All right, so let me go to the PowerPoint. Uh, can you see the PowerPoint, everyone? Yes, my Yes, my Oh, good. Okay. Hmm. Let's see. All right, so the first section of the first chapter was like this. We were hearing how Vidura recommended the Pandavas share to be returned and Duryodhan should be expelled. So when Duryodhan heard this, then he became very angry. And of course, Dhritarashtra was also not going to do this anyway. Vidura was recommending this to Dhritarashtra. So Duryodhana hearing him, hearing this uh, thinking of Vidura, that Vidura wanted to have Duryodhana, Duryodhana expelled, and Duryodhana had Vidura expelled and he, he wanted Vidura thrown out and beaten at the same time. So Vidura took that opportunity to leave and to go and travel on pilgrimage. So this is the point, he's going to travel on pilgrimage. Let's see the next section here, 17 to 24. Uh, well, before we talk about Prabhashetra, first of all, Prabhupada discusses in text number 17, why, why did Vidura go on pilgrimage and visit holy places? Why didn't he just go and take shelter of Lord Krishna? He was already a 
a devotee of Lord Krishna, so why didn't he just simply go to Lord Krishna and take shelter of Lord Krishna? Lord Krishna was personally present on the planet at the time, and there's Vidura going off to go and visit holy places, to go around the temples. So, what was the reason for that? Would someone like to respond to this? Yes? We will ask the students. Maharaj, uh, in the purport it says, Vidura considered himself less pious and therefore he decided to travel to all the great places of pilgrimage to achieve greater piety and advance nearer to the Lord. Yes. Well, not only less pious, but he didn't, he had incurred some some sin. Why? What had happened? What had he done? What did, what had Vidura done which caused him to lose his piety? Maybe some of the girls, the ladies there who are in the class can answer. I haven't heard a female voice yet, but I see some ladies are there. I thought I was having all men in the class. I never heard a woman's voice. Oh, you have to speak up, Mariji. I, I'm not able to hear. I'm sorry. Is there some way you, you can get a microphone there? No, not enough. Got to be louder. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yet Vidura was was there in the palace at the time when Draupadi was an attempt was made to disrobe Draupadi. Yeah. Yeah. And so he should he should have voiced his protest against this and tried to stop it. Maharaj, one more thing I want to add, Maharaj, because he took Hare Krishna, Maharaj, are you able to hear me? Yeah, very good now. Yes, Maharaj, actually one more thing, he actually took the association of uh, Dhritarashtra. Yes. And uh, Duryodhana, so maybe the, for that he is feeling little Yes, I think that's the main reason, that's the real point here, that he'd been associating with Dhritarashtra and Duryodhana, he'd been living there in the palace with them and working with them and listening to them. So. Certainly, that kind of association was having a very bad effect on him. And he needs to purify himself. He felt the need to purify himself. And how to purify himself? He went to visit the holy places, to travel around the holy places, and to bathe in the holy rivers, and to go and see the deities in the different temples, and sometimes also to hear from the great sages who were there. So this is described for us in some detail in verses 17 to 24, how Vidura is traveling around these holy places and he wants to, and, and, and he wants to purify himself before going to meet Lord Krishna, to actually come well, we'll read that section from the, the 17th uh, verse there, verse 17 purport. Prabhupada writes, Vidura was conscious that by the association of the diplomatic Dhritarashtra and Duryodhana, he had lost his piety 
and was therefore not fit to associate at once with the Lord. In the Bhagavad Gita, this is confirmed in the following verse. And then the verse comes, 728, right? That persons who are sinful, asuras like Kamsa and Jarasandha, cannot think of Lord Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Absolute Truth. Only those who are pure devotees, those who follow the regulative principles of religious life as prescribed in the scriptures, are able to engage themselves in karma yoga and then jnana yoga, and thereafter, by pure meditation, they can understand pure consciousness. So, like that Prabhupada's describing the yoga ladder there, that uh, you can do it like that. You can go to karma yoga and then jnana yoga and then come to bhakti yoga, the association. And then Prabhupada quotes this verse from the second chapter of the first canto, right? Syan Mahatsevaya Vipra Punya Tirta Neshevanat, right? Sushushrosha Dhanana Shya Vasudev Kataruchi, Syan Mahatsevaya Vipra, right? Uh, by rendering service to pure devotees, then you develop a taste for hearing the glories of the Lord. Mm. So what Prabhupada said, one is able to associate with the Lord even during the existence of this life. How to do it? We have to purify ourselves. We have to develop that consciousness to actually be worthy to be with the Lord, to come to that level of devotion. So then, Prabhupada. See you and an imperfect marriage. Sorry. To see the slide in you. Sorry. Sorry, we are unable to see you, Maharaj. Uh, your your video and the perfect. You want to see me, or do you want to see the slide? Both, Maharaj. <laughs> how, how do we do that? Yeah. Maharaj, your video in the Zoom was off, so we start, thought maybe I missed you. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. It was on the Zoom that um, video thought was missing. Can you see me now? No, Maharaj. Why don't you start sharing the slides? It went off, so we just thought, I, I, I disturbed you. Yeah, right. Well, it's, I, you know, either you see the slide or you see me, if you... It's... Okay, ma'am, it's as you wish. We hear you. Yeah. I, uh, let's work with the slides just now while we're on this thing. All right, so Prabhupada talks about the, the mood, the proper mood and going on pilgrimage, going to the holy place. It's important. And we see a lot of people come to Mayapur or go to Vrindavan and, you know, the mood is not always quite as it should be. The, the proper mood in coming to the holy place is we're coming to the holy place to to increase our remembrance of the Lord. We should not just come to the holy place just to meet old friends or just to go shopping and just to, uh, to have a lazy time. But the mood should be, the proper mood should be there, that we're coming to the holy place to increase our remembrance of the Lord. So Vidura was very conscious of this and he was alone usually, he travelled alone and he would constantly chant the holy names of the Lord and he would be conscious of the Lord at every place he went to by remembering the pastimes and qualities of the Lord. In the purport of text 17 also, Prabhupada mentions like this, he said, 
One should not be satisfied, however, merely by visiting the places of pilgrimage and performing one's prescribed duties. Prescribed duties means things like bathing in the holy rivers, going to see the deities and offering obeisances, giving charity, these kind of things. But, one should, Prabhupada explains it, he should be eager to meet the great souls who are already there, engaged in the service of the Lord. Of course, it's not always so easy to find these people. You have to, you have to, <laughs> you have to have the mercy of Krishna to look out for them. And somehow Vidura was fortunate that he was able to meet some of these great souls. Actually, the Lord is in the heart of everyone, and the Lord directs us. When we have that genuine desire, the Lord will bring us in touch with these great souls, right? By the mercy of the spiritual master, we get the mercy of Krishna. And by the mercy of Krishna, we get the mercy of the spiritual teachers. So the chapter goes on to describe how Vidura is at Prabhashetra and he, ha he hears Prabhashetra, this is in Gujarat, this is the, one of the holy places visited by Vidura. And when he was there, he heard how the Kauravas and the Yadavas had all, ex ex they had, there had been an extinction of all of these races. So certainly that would be a great shock to Vidura. Of course, after the, after the Yadavas had annihilated themselves, then Lord Krishna also left the world. But while he's at Prabhashetra, he simply hears about the Kauravas and the Yadavas leaving the world. So that was a shock to him because he's, he himself is a Kaurava. He's from that family and he's very intimately connected with the Yadavas. They're very friendly with each other. They have close relationships. So hearing about the annihilation of these two dynasties would be a great shock to Vidura. However, he continues with his visiting of holy places. And he comes back to central region of India and we're told on the bank of the Yamuna he meets Uddhava. And then the rest of the chapter we will hear Vidura inquiring from Uddhava and he wants to inquire about he will ask about the Yadavas in Dwarka, and the Pandavas, and he, then he also requests Uddhava to glorify Lord Krishna. So just let me finish these other slides here before we go back to the chapter. This is dealing with, the, with Maya and the external potency from text number 10, Duryodhan, under the influence of Maya, the external energy was making progress on the path towards his own ruination. So Duryodhan was going into his own, he was ruining himself and it was due to the influence of Maya. So he was under the influence of Maya but we're told also of Vidura, he, could, he also saw how the internal energy of the Lord helped him in that particular situation. So that is in relation to Vidura, the internal energy of the Lord, which is also the Lord's Maya, was helping him.
we sometimes do a group exercise here and we ask the, the devotees to give examples of this from Shastra, from the lives of our Acharyas, other devotees and from our own lives. We heard a nice example in the last class, one devotee was describing his own life, how he was working in the job and uh, they were all taking drugs and because he wouldn't take drugs he was sacked from the company but then the next week all the other devotees were arrested and put behind bars. So that was a nice example of Maya acting internally and externally in his own life. Other devotees We must, we, we, maybe you, you like to think of some examples about other devotees, how Maya act in their life, the lives of our Acharyas, we spoke about Srila Prabhupada, Ramanuja Acharya, Lord Chaitanya, Shastra, from Shastra I gave you the example of the, the Brahmana from Avanti Desh. Let's see. There are many examples. Yes? Anyone like to contribute another example? Maharaj Vijay Prabhu had mentioned about Haridas Chakur. I think that was a very nice example. In with what regard? What happened? Uh, on the how he was uh, externally maybe uh, you know, wrote that uh, I assume uh, he being hit at different places uh, but then he was uh, that was making him more closer to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Can we think of that Maharaj? Haridas Thakur, what, what exactly were you saying? He was beaten? Yeah, beaten at 24 different markets. Places. In the different marketplaces, yes. So, how was this in relation to Maya? How so, was it acting internally? Yeah, in, internally he was uh, he was always uh, um, becoming closer and closer to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. In fact, Mahaprabhu was taking the beatings for him. But externally, for people, it was as if uh, uh, they they wanted to treat. Uh, they wanted to teach uh, Haridas a lesson, rather it became a lesson for the people. Okay. So, externally it appears he was beaten, but internally he was becoming closer to Krishna or Lord Chaitanya. Will that be a right understanding, Maharaj? Well, uh, yes, I guess so. Uh, yeah, I think it's not... It's, it's good, nice example, yes. It, Lord Chaitanya was taking the beating for him. Of course, Haridas was not thinking like that, but it, it was arranged like that, that the Lord personally protected him. And externally, it was a, he was being beaten, but internally, well, he was taking shelter of Krishna. He, he was exhibiting his faith in the holy name. He didn't stop chanting. Even though he was being beaten, he didn't stop chanting the holy name. And then finally when the, the people who were beating him said, if, if you don't die, then we'll be punished ourselves. So when Haridas heard that, then he himself said, oh, then, all right, then he gave up his own consciousness, he became unconscious, and then they thought he was dead, and they, but actually he was not dead, but they threw his body into the Ganga, and he floated down the Ganga, and he came back to consciousness, and he came out of the Ganga. And so then they were amazed, people were amazed that he had survived. And they understood he was really a great personality. Okay, so Maya does act 
in a way which helps to bring we spoke also we heard about Queen Kunti right we we're just speaking about Kunti that it seemed like she was suffering her sons were suffering difficulties but she was not affected materially she was coming closer to Krishna the difficulties which they were going through were bringing her to Krishna so this is the point right that Maya is working, it, it, it appears to be giving us trouble, difficulties, but these difficulties are God sent and they help us to come closer to Krishna. Okay, here's a quotation from Srila Prabhupada. Maybe one of you can read this for me. Shall I read, Maharaj? Please, yes. Maya acting internally and externally. A pure devotee of the Lord is never perturbed by an awkward position created by the external energy of the Lord. A devotee is always in a renounced temperament because the worldly attractions can never satisfy him. Srimad Bhagavatam 3.1.16 per foot. Hare Krishna. Thank you. So devotee is always renounced, right? We are detached from the material world. If we lose something, we lose all of our wealth, we lose all everything. Okay, Krishna took what to be what can be done. Worldly attraction can never satisfy the devotee. So we should not be perturbed by a difficult situation. Another one? Someone else read? Therefore, by his grace, the external energy which is employed in illusioning those living beings who want to have it, subsides by the will of the Lord in terms of repentance and penance for the conditioned soul. And the very same energy then acts to help the purified living being make progress on the path of self-realization. The example of electrical energy is very appropriate in this connection. Read a bit more. The expert electrician can utilize the electrical energy for both heating and cooling by adjustment only. Similarly, the external energy which now bewilders the living being into continuation of birth and death is turned into internal potency by the will of the Lord to lead the living being to eternal life. When a living being is thus graced by the Lord, he is placed in his proper constitutional position to enjoy eternal spiritual life. Srimad Bhagavatam 1.3.34 mm -hmm. So what do we want? Do we want Condition, to be conditioned in this material world and subject to all the miseries of material life? Or do we want to enjoy eternal spiritual life? And so Vidura found, you know, the freedom, the so-called freedom which he had in the palace was not like the freedom which he had when he went out of the palace. He had real freedom going out of the palace and going in to visit the holy places. He did not actually have real freedom at home in the palace. So the devotee can realize that. He can realize that the, 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 how the Lord arranges these things for us to bring us to a higher consciousness. Okay, one more. Someone else read. If the illusory energy subsides and the living entity becomes fully enriched with knowledge by the grace of the Lord, then he becomes at once enlightened with self-realization and thus becomes situated in his own glory. Srimad Bhagavatam 1.3.3 So if the illusory energy subsides, <laughs> we hope it will subside, right? Then we become enriched with knowledge. So how does the illusory energy subside? We have to take shelter of Krishna. We have to turn to Krishna. Yes, someone else read? Madhaji can, can read this one. And the whole world is problem for ordinary persons, but to us it is not problem, because we see everything Krishna's. If there is problem, it is Krishna's problem. Why my problem? Krishna can know how to solve problem. So we have no problem practically, Krishna's problem. Krishna will see to it. Just like Arjuna was encouraged that Nimitta Matram Bhavasavya Satchin, you don't worry about your victory. I have already arranged. 
So we should have such faith and conviction and let us try. Let us do very sincerely and seriously, then everything Krishna will do. Srimad Bhagavatam 15829, New Vrindavan, 1969. <laughs> okay, so everything's Krishna's, so the problems are also Krishna. <laughs> so this is Prabhupada's vision. Okay, that's the sec next chapter. Okay, so that's the slides we want to go on there. Huh? I'm not quite sure how I'm supposed to open the camera on this Prabhu, coming back to uh, Maharaj, in the down in the YouTube uh, where the audio is just beside that there is a video symbol. Oh, okay, yeah, I see it. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you got it now. Right, of course, I for forgot that. Okay. All right, so... Can, can we take Pankajangri Prabhu's example here? Which example? Pankajangri Prabhu is passing away. Take it as an example of what? By external energy, it is as if uh, he was suffering from Corona. Of course. But then he, he always wanted to return back to my friend. We always in national consciousness is what we understand. So you're thinking Pankajangari's departure was it the internal w arrangement of Krishna, the internal potency of Krishna? Yes, Maharaj, that's right. I was thinking. I well, certainly for a devotee, for the devotees like that, definitely it's going to be Krishna's arrangement. We don't think of it as being anything different, anything separate from Krishna. Certainly, devotees under the hands, in the, under the care of Krishna, and he he leaves the world. It's the arrangement of Krishna. It's not karma. Devotees don't have karma. It's the plan of Krishna. Krishna brings us to this world, and, and Krishna takes us out, takes us to some other place, goes some other place to serve Krishna. Service to Krishna goes on. Yeah, it was it was a sudden departure, unexpected, and it was a great loss. It's always a great loss when we lose the devotees. It's, but it's glorious for him. He had a glorious departure. He left in the Holy Dham. He dedicated so many of his year, 50 years, to the service of Krishna. And then he departed. He's gone off to serve Krishna. Krishna took him to do service some other place. We see it all as the arrangement of Krishna. Krishna must need him for some service, some other place. He already did so much for Mayapur. Now Krishna wants him to go some other place. took him away. So, yeah, we, we certainly would see that as the internal potency, Krishna's plan, taking him out of our association. Okay, so we want to speak about Vidura meeting these different people who were all uh, connected with Dwarka, first of all, right? He's going to speak about uh, Dwar the different devotees who were living in Dwarka with Lord Krishna. First we hear about Vidura meeting Uddhava. And Vidura is older, of course. Uddhava is a younger, much younger man than Vidura. Vidura sees the, the brother of Dhritarashtra and Pandu. Pandu already died. Dhritarashtra is old man with grown-up sons. So Vidura is also not a young man. 
and he'd been traveling for 30 to 35 years in the holy places. And then he meets Uddhava, who is a constant companion of Lord Krishna. And we're told also that Uddhava was a great student of Brihaspati. So he's highly educated. Brihaspati is the guru of the demigods. And somehow Uddhava had the opportunity to be also the student of Brihaspati. So Vidura asks him, about news of the family of Lord Krishna. Why did Vidura ask? He already heard that they'd already left the world. So this is an interesting point to be understood. Why does Vidura want to ask about this? He already knows what happened. But he asks again, Prabhupada's purport, he writes there in the purport of text number uh, 25, this inquiry appears to be very queer, but Srila Jiva Goswami states that the news was shocking to Vidura, who therefore inquired again due to great curiosity. Thus his inquiry was psychological and not practical. In other words, it was such a shock to Vidura to hear that everybody had left the world, that he wanted to have it confirmed again. So he's asking, he's asking Uddhava, do you have news about Lord Krishna and his family? He just wants that whatever he's heard, you know, sometimes we hear things which are so shocking, we don't like to accept it. and so. We don't like to ask, is it really true? We don't ask directly, we just, but you can see uh, Vidura very diplomatically saying, do you have any news about Lord Krishna and his family? How are they? And he goes on mentioning the names of all the different members, actually. First of all, he begins with asking about Lord Krishna himself. That how, how about Lord Krishna and Lord Balaram, that they are the personalities of Godhead and they've, they appeared and they've increased the prosperity of the world. And, and then Vidura asks, are they doing well in the house of Sura Sain? The, he wants to know about Krishna and Balaram. And then next he will ask about the relatives, and he talked, he said, how about the best friend of the Kurus, our brother-in-law, Vasudev, is he doing well? He is very munificent. He's like a father to his sisters, and he's always pleasing to his wives. Remember how many wives does Vasudev have? Sorry? Sixteen. Sixteen, right. Sixteen wives, you know. He must be a busy man, right? But he must be also a very good husband because it's described here, he is always pleasing to his wives. So that's important. The husband can please the wife. That's not an easy thing to do. <laughs> right? Sometimes people say to me, oh, it's so difficult to please my wife. <laughs> it's, it's the hardest thing. So here's Vasudev, he's so expert, he can please all 16 wives. So Vidura wants to know, how is he doing? Is he doing all right? Is he well? And, and then after Vasudev, then we hear about uh, he wants to know about Prajumna, Prajumna, the commander-in-chief of the Yadus, right? Do you know the story from the Krishna book? Have you read this, the story about Prajumna in the Krishna book, which is Prabhupada's summary study of 10th canto? It's a great help to us in understanding Srimad Bhagavatam. So who is Prajumna? 
Someone can tell me? Son of Krishna. Son of Krishna and which wife? Rukmini. Right, right, Rukmini. And who was he in his former life? Kamadev. Kamadev. Yes, Kamadev, right? And so, he's Kamadev. It's not, when we talk of Prajumna, we're not talking about the Vishnu Tattva, they're not the, not the Chaturvyuha. He's not Vishnu Tattva, he's Jiva Tattva. He was a, a demigod, right? So, he, Rukmini bore him as her son from Lord Krishna by the grace of Brahmanas whom she pleased. And do you remember the story in Krishna book, what happened to Prajumna? As a little baby, what happened? Have you read this? Yes, right. He was supposed, the, that demon Sambara heard that this Prajumna is going to kill him. So the demon came and got the baby. What did he do with the baby? He threw him into the ocean. ocean. Uh, right, he threw him into the ocean. And then what happened? One fish swallowed him. A fish swallowed him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's quite an, an amusing story. Yeah. And then again, that uh, fish will be gifted to Samrasur, and Samrasur uh, gives it to the kitchen for uh, cooking it, and uh, <laughs> opens that, Rajivna will come out, and then that uh, particular lady, she will uh, uh, take care of him. After uh, when he grown up, he will be Samrasur. Yes, right. <laughs> Wonderful, uh, no, a very interesting pastime. And then, so Prajumna grows up and then he goes and challenges Sambara, he kills the demon Sambara, right? And then he goes back to, but because uh, his wife, it's, well, first of all, he'd, he'd been Cupid in his previous life, but he'd been burned to ashes by Lord Shiva. He did something offensive to Lord Shiva and Lord Shiva burned him to ashes. So somehow when he came as Prajumna, when he came as the son of Lord Krishna, then he was able to meet with his wife again because his wife was working as a maidservant in the, home, in the home of the demon Samba. And in this way they were united and then they go off to Dwarka. And Rukmini is very happy she got her son back. She thought she had lost her son. So that's Prajumna. And then, they, then he asked about Ugrasen. Ugrasen, of course, had been the king. Now, Ugrasen, he has a, an interest. Who is the son of Ugrasen? Kamsa? Yes, right. Kamsa is the son of Ugrasen. So what happened to Ugrasen when Kamsa, Kamsa grew up? He put his father in the prison. He put his father in prison. He was such a demon. Kamsa put his own father in the jail as well as Vasudev and Devaki. So Ugrasen, he had been the king, but Kamsa took over and put his father in jail. And, but when Lord Krishna killed Kamsa, then Lord Krishna brought Ugrasen back and told him, you be, sit on the throne, you be the king again. You should be the king. Lord Krishna didn't take the kingdom for himself. Lord Krishna gave it back to Ugrasen, put Ugrasen on the throne. So he wants to know about all these people, of course, Oh, then Samba, Samba is the son of Jambavati, one of Krishna's sons by Jambavati, one of Krishna's prominent wives. And in his previous life it said he was Kartikeya and he, would, he had been born in the womb of the wife of Lord Shiva. But then he became Next birth he was born in the womb of Jambavati. So Samba, <laughs> he has some interesting pastimes also. Do you remember what Samba did? He kidnapped 
kidnapped uh, Duryodhana's uh, daughter. Yes, right. And who saved them? Who came to the rescue? Lord Balram. Right, yes, wonderful. It's a wonderful pastime. And then also we hear also about Samba dressing up as a woman and putting a metal ball in his, under his cloth like it's, and, and, and he looks like a pregnant wom woman. And so they take him before the great sages and they ask him, Oh great sages, what kind of child is this woman going to give birth to? All right, do you know that pastime? And what, what, did, what did they hear? What do the sages say? Sages. The sages say? Iron rod. They say whoever will be born from this will be responsible for the destruction. Yeah, yeah this, this will destroy the, the whole Yadu dynasty, all the Yadu dynasty. And so Ugrasena, he got that metal ball and he ground it into filings and cast it into the sea. And those filings came back and they were absorbed in the reeds which grow along the side of the ocean. And when the Yadu dynasty all went to Prabhakshetra, they took those reeds and they fought with each other and they killed each other. But there was one piece of metal which was in the ball which could not be ground into filings and that became the head of the arrow, right? For the hunter Jara. And they said that was the arrowhead which was fired into the foot of Lord Krishna. Of course, not actually Lord Krishna, but the, the Maya Krishna who was there. Everything happened with Samba. Samba was involved in a lot of things. But he was a great king. He was also a great Kshatriya. And so Vidura is asking also, how is Samba? And then he asks also, he wants to know about um, uh, Yuyudan. Yuyudana. He's mentioned in the first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Yuyudana has another name. You know his other name? Satyaki Maharaj. Yes, right. Satyaki, right. So he's, uh, he's a great charioteer, a great fighter. And he learned military art from Arjuna. So... Vidura is asking, is he well? But at the same time, we're, it's difficult to understand. It said, he attained the transcendental destination, which is very difficult to reach, even for great renouncers. So I, I don't know, I read it, I was thinking maybe he'd gone back to Godhead. But Vidura is asking, is he well? So it means he's, he's the liberated soul, but he's still within this world. And then he wants to know about Akrura. And Akrura, we've heard also how Akrura brought Krishna and Balaram to Mathura. He was sent by Kamsa, of course. And somehow Vidura, he knows about Akrura because he describes that, he describes the pastime of Akrura coming to Vrindavan. He said he once lost his mental equilibrium due to his ecstasy of transcendental love and fell down on the dust of a road which was marked with the footprints of Lord Krishna. So it's an interesting point that Akrura fell in the dust when he reached Vrindavan. So we, would, we may question, is it necessary that we will fall in the dust when we come to the holy place? When you go to Vrindavan, do you roll in the dust? Right? You've all been to Vrindavan, right? You've all been to Vrindavan or Mayapur. 
Did you roll in the dust? You rolled in the dust, yeah? Yes, Good. Yeah. Did, did you have Krishna Prem when you rolled in the dust? Were you in ecstasy? Yes. Yes. Some some kind of ecstasy, right? Some shadow bhava, bhava, the stage bhava, all right. So anyway, Akrura, he comes to Vrindavan, and he, see, he and what is his consciousness in coming to Vrindavan? As soon as he got the order from Kamsa, you know, Akrura is. Remember a devotee of Lord Krishna and one of the relatives, his uncle, and he knows Kamsa is a demon and he knows Krishna is the personality of Godhead. And then Kamsa comes, this demon Kamsa comes and asks Akrur, go to Vrindavan and bring Krishna and Balaram and Kamsa tells him, I'm arranging a wrestling match, I want them to come. And so. How does Akrura take that instruction? Maybe the mercy of the Lord. The mercy of the Lord? Yeah, will of the Lord. Why? Yes, it's an opportunity for him to meet Lord Krishna. That's very important to him. And he's aware of Lord Krishna's identity. He's aware that he is the personality of Godhead. So Krura is actually very eager to go there. Although, at the same time, he's going on behalf of Kamsa. But he takes it as an opportunity to see Lord Krishna and to remember Lord Krishna and to be absorbed in thinking of Lord Krishna, even though he is coming as a servant of Kamsa. So Jiva Goswami discusses this in his Sandarbhas. He talks about this... Uh, example here about Akrura, how he's coming to Vrindavan and he sees the footprints of Lord Krishna and what does he think when he sees the footprints of Lord Krishna? He, he jumps off the chariot and he rolls in the dust. He thinks, this is the dust from the feet of my master. This is the dust from his lotus feet. So he's so he's just in ecstasy. Of course, he'd been absorbed in thought of Krishna on his journey to Vrindavan. And when he got to Vrindavan and actually saw the lotus footprints of Lord Krishna, then he immediately without hesitating. He just rolled, jumped off the chariot and rolled in that dust. So he had that ecstasy, he had that, that love for Krishna. So all of these devotees who Vidura is inquiring about, they're all very special souls. They're intimately connected with the pastimes of Lord Krishna. Vidura has been inquiring about the people from Dwarka. These are these people of all of course Krishna moved everyone from Mathura to Dwarka. And so Ugrasena and Vasudev and now next one is Devaki. He, he wants to know about Mother Devaki, is she well? and Krishna's sons, of course, because his wives are all there in Dwarka, and so the sons are also there. So he's asking about the people in Dwarka, 
but then after hearing about the people in Dwarka, then he, Vidura will ask about the Pandavas. Oh, there's one more. Here's Aniruddha. Aniruddha, is he doing well? Who is Aniruddha? In, in Dwarka. Who? Yes, son of Prajumna, right. Prajumna's son. And described here that uh, Vidura describes him that he, he, is, he is the fulfiller of all the desires of the pure devotees and has been self has been has been considered from your to be the cause of the Rig Veda, the creator of the mind, and the fourth plenary expansion of Vishnu. So here we have the chapter of Yuha, Vasudev Sankarshan, Aniruddha, Prajumna. So this Aniruddha, he is the fourth plenary expansion of Vishnu. So he is Vishnu Tattva. And he comes as the grandson of Lord Krishna. And we hear also in 10th Canto pastimes of, of Aniruddha, right? Who is, what happens to Aniruddha? Uh, Aniruddha, uh, uh, he'll marry Usha. Yes, right. Usha and Anirudh, right. But how did he get involved with Usha and Anirudh? How did they get together? Uh, Ani, uh, Usha's friend uh, brings Anirudh to Usha's uh, palace and then they will uh, meet there and then one day uh, that uh, demon name uh, that he will uh, uh, find uh, uh, Anirudh and then he captures him. Yes, what right. Right, Usha. Usha is the daughter of Bana. Banasur, right? The daughter of Banasur. And so he keeps his daughter chaste. He keeps her away from all the men. But still somehow she had a dream. And she was with another girlfriend. And she was dream in her dream she was talking to a man. So her girlfriend was Chitraleka and she was very expert in drawing pictures and she drew pictures of different princesses and she was drawing pictures of all the different men. And then finally she came to the Yadu dynasty and she drew a picture of Lord Krishna and that was very similar to Anirudh and it affected, she could see that this was having some effect on Usha. And then after, after Lord Krishna, then she drew the picture of Anirudh and then this Usha blushed that this was the boy who had come in her dream. Somehow the boy had come in her dream, although they had never met before. But by the arrangement of destiny, somehow this young boy came, young man came in her dream. So Chitraleka has yoga powers. And by her yoga powers, she goes off to Dwarka and she brings Anirudh for him, for, uh, for Usha rather. She brings Anirudh in his sleep, she brings him to, to the palace of Banasura. And so they're together for some time. And then after some time, then they notice that this uh, Usha is no longer the chaste virgin girl anymore. They can see a change in her. And they report to her father. And so then Banasura comes and then there's a great fight. But Banasura has got many weapons. He's got some Naga Pasha and he's able to arrest Anirudh. He takes him prisoner. And so then Narada Muni has to go and inform Lord Krishna. And then Lord Krishna comes and then there's a great battle. There's a great battle between Banasura and Lord Krishna and their armies and Banasura has Lord Shiva on his side fighting for him and Lord Shiva has his sons Ganesh and Kartikeya there and so they're all fighting it's a really big battle but Lord Krishna comes with all of his sons and armies and ultimately Krishna's 
Bharata's army is victorious and they cut off Banasura's arms because Banasura had many arms by the blessing of Lord Shiva. He had many arms. So Lord Krishna cut off his arms and left him with two arms and made him humble because when he had many arms he was very proud. So in this way Usha and Aniruddha were uh, united and they went back to Dwarka with Lord Krishna. So Vidura wants to know how is Aniruddha? And then he asks about others. Others such as Riddhika, Charudeshna, Gada and the son of Satyabhama. So Charudeshna is, who is Charudeshna, anybody know? Charudeshna is one of the sons of Krishna and Rukmini. Krishna and Rukmini had several sons. And Gada, he is one of the sons of Vasudev and Rohini. Right? Vasudev, we said he has 16 wives. Devaki is one wife, Rohini is another wife. So Gada is one of these sons. He's like the younger brother of Balaram. So all of these different people, Vidura wants to know, how are they? Are they well? Now who didn't... Subhadra is Huh? Subhadra? What's that? Subhadra is Rohini's or Devaki's daughter? Subhadra is the daughter of... Uh, she's the daughter of Rohini, right? There, there's different Subhadras, yeah. <laughs> you have to understand, there's different Subhadras. One daughter is from Rohini. Which, which one did Arjuna marry? He also married Subhadra, right? So the Subhadra, she was a very, she was a very favorite girl to Lord Krishna. She was very beautiful. So it was arranged. Krishna wanted Arjuna to marry her. But Lord Balaram, of course, was very angry about that. So that's Subhadra. And, and she is, uh, she is y Yoga Maya. So going ahead, text 36, we hear, how is Maharaj Yudhisthira? So Vidura has finished with all the Dwarkavasis and now he's come to Hastinapur and he's asking about the Pandavas and he begins asking about Maharaj Yudhisthira, is he, how is he, is he well, he's maintaining the kingdom according to religious principles. And he describes, he says, uh, how Krishna and Arjuna were like his arms. They're like the arms of Maharaj Yudhisthira because they help him to rule the kingdom and to oversee everything. The king cannot do everything on his own, but he has Krishna and Arjuna there. They're his arms and with their help he's able to rule the kingdom. And then Vidura asks about Bhima and he says Bhima is like a cobra and he's got so much anger against the, the sinners, against the people who did them injustice. He's very eager to get revenge on these people who put so many difficulties into the lives of the Pandavas. Of course his, his enemies are really the Kauravas. 
and we see that in the battle of Kurukshetra that Bhima was able to kill all the 100 sons of Dhritarashtra. So Vidura asks about Bhima and then he asks about Arjuna and he knows Arjuna is famous for carrying the Gandiva bow and he's very powerful in fighting his enemies, he's so powerful. Vidura said that he even satisfied Lord Shiva, that one time Lord Shiva came disguised as a hunter and there was some dispute over a boar. Arjuna had been hunting and killed a boar, but Lord Shiva came in the form of a hunter and he said, no, it's mine, I killed it. And so there was an argument between the two of them and they fought with each other and it was actually Arjuna who covered Lord Shiva with arrows. And in this way Lord Shiva was satisfied with the skill and the power of Arjuna. So that was remembered by Vidura, the power of Arjuna, that he's so powerful he could even fight with Lord Shiva. And then he asks about the two, the twin brothers, he calls them twin brothers meaning Nakula and Sahadev, the two sons who were actually born from Madri by the Ashwini Kumars, right? So how are they? The twins are protected by the, they're always protected by their older brothers. And he, Vidura describes that uh, the Pandavas, they snatch back their kingdom from the hands of the enemy Duryodhan. Because we, we described in the last class how Dhritarashtra and Duryodhan were ruling the kingdom. So then the Pandavas had to go into exile for so many years and after their exile was over, then they came back and they want the kingdom. And Vidura said, they took back the kingdom just as Garuda snatches nectar from the mouth of Indra, the thunderbolt carrier. And so they didn't hesitate to snatch back the kingdom. But of course, they've got to fight for it. It's not easy. So he's asked about all the Pandavas and then he's, he asks also, how about Queen Kunti? Prita, is she still living? She must be old now. She's get her age is she's not a young woman anymore. Her sons are all grown up. They're powerful men. Is she she she's living only for the sake of her children? Otherwise, how could she do it? She lost her husband. So Vidura asks about Prita. And we notice Vidura didn't ask about Dhritarashtra or Duryodhana. He didn't ask, although Dhritarashtra is his elder brother, he didn't ask. But now, without mentioning their names, he talks about them. And that comes in text 41. He says, I simply lament for him. He doesn't mention his name. I simply lament for him who rebelled against his brother after the latter's death. By Dhritarashtra I was driven out of my own house, although I am his sincere follower, well-wisher, because he accepted the line of action adopted by his own sons. Mm. Yeah, so Vidura doesn't actually mention the name Dhritarashtra there, although Prabhupada has put it in to the translation, it's, it's there in the translation, but it's not in the Sanskrit, there's no mention of him. He doesn't want to mention it, but he indicates who he's talking about. 
And Vidura describes how he's benefited by traveling over the holy places. He's seen so many things. He's been out of the palace, away from the palace. So he's been able to see the world in so many different situations. And he's, he's got a lot of realization about this. So he said, I'm not astonished at this because he's been traveling the world, so he's seen how the world is. This is the material world. And we do see a lot of horrible things, a lot of unpleasant things going on in the world. And so the fact that Dhritarashtra was so corrupt and impious, it didn't surprise him anymore. But he he is he is he does desire vidura says he does desire to understand more about the activities of the personality of godhead he said these things the activities of the supreme lord they're bewildering so how to understand them Vidura himself says, he said, I know of his greatness by his grace, and thus I am happy in all respects. So Vidura, because he's a, been traveling to so many holy places, he's a pure devotee, so he can understand the position of Lord Krishna. That's the benefit he got from going on pilgrimage for so many years that he was able to develop his relationship with the Lord. He had purified himself. And Prabhupada in the purport there, text 42, he describes this stage of life which Vidura had reached. He said it's Abhayam Sadvata Abhayam sadva sam shudhi. Abhayam sadva sam shudhi. This is text, uh, chapter 16 of the Bhagavad Gita. The big beginning, the first verses of the chapter 16. Lord Krishna is describing the qualities of one, of the, of the devotee. Right? There's the quality of the demon and the do chapter 16, divine and demoniac nature. So Krishna begins by describing the divine qualities and then he goes in more detail into the demonic qualities. So Prabhupada quotes here, he said, the stage of life which Vidura had reached to actually realize and understand the Lord and how the Lord is protecting him at every stage, this is called Abhayam Sattvasam. Abhayam sattva samshuddhi. Sattva samshuddhi, meaning purity of existence, and abhayam fearlessness. To actually go on that, that level, to go to visit holy places like that, it's described Vidura, he didn't have a bed, he didn't have anything, he couldn't take care of his hair. We see people often who are traveling in holy places, you know, they have the matted locks. They don't go taking care of their hair every day, putting oil on their hair and combing the hair. They're not going to do that. They have matted locks. And he didn't even have a bed. He was just laying on the ground. But he was completely fearless. He had purified his existence. And in this way, he could understand the protection of the Lord, the mercy of the Lord at every stage of his life. Prabhupada quotes uh, the Srimad Bhagavatam, how the devotees of the Lord are Narayana Para. Narayana Para, right? Narayana, Narayana Para, Nakutam Narayana Para Vyaktam. Oh, I for, I'm forgetting all my verses now. Narayana, the verse says, anyway, those who are devotees of Lord Narayan, 
they don't see any difference. Swarga, Apavarga, Narakesh, Vapitu, Yatadarshana. Narayana Parasarve, Nakutas Chanya Vibhyate, Swarga, Apavarga, Narakesh, Vapitu, Yatadarshana. Those who are actually surrendered to the Lord, they, they don't see any difference between heaven or hell or liberation. Wherever they are, they're always aware that the Lord is there to protect them in all circumstances. So like this, Vidura was traveling alone, was not recognized by anyone, he enjoyed freedom without obligation to the many duties of the world. That is actual real freedom because he had surrendered himself to Lord Krishna. All right, we just have a few more verses to finish this chapter. Text 43. Despite his being the Lord and being always willing to relieve the distress of sufferers, he, Krishna, refrained from killing the Kurus, although they committed all sorts of sins, and although he saw other kings constantly agitating the earth by their strong military movements carried out under the dictation of three kinds of false pride. So the question comes up, why did Lord Krishna not immediately take action against the offenders to Mother Draupadi? They had committed so many offences, not only to Draupadi, to the Pandavas as well. Why didn't Lord Krishna take action? What was he waiting on? Someone can tell me? Maharaj was uh, wanting everybody to come, to get collected in the war of Kurukshetra. Yes. So that Bring every, everybody together and kill them all wholesale, right? Get, them, get all the killing done at one time. Prabhupada said the same thing about something. He said sometimes, you know, these airplanes crash, they carry hundreds of people. He said sometimes Krishna arranges like that. He said, brings the people together and they, they're all, all killed. He said, it's Krishna's arrangement to re relieve the earth of the burden. Just like the earth was overburdened at the time of Kurukshetra, before Kurukshetra, the earth was overburdened by so many demons, demonic kshatriyas. So Krishna brought them all together. Let's kill them all, let them all kill each other. All the killing can be done wholesale. And this way, all the business can be taken care of. So Lord Krishna brought everyone together. And then, text 44, the appearance of Lord Krishna is manifested for the annihilation of the upstarts. So Vidura questions, why did Lord Krishna come to the earth? Since the Lord is transcendental to all material modes, what purpose could he serve by coming to the earth? This is Vidura's question to Lord Krishna. Uh, to, rather to Uddhava. He wants Uddhava to describe the Lord's purpose, the Lord's mission in coming into this world. And Prabhupada in the purport talks about the different purposes. First, the, the first reason Lord Krishna comes is to give pleasure to the devotees. 
that they relish the superhuman activities of the Lord. So that's the first reason the Lord comes, to give pleasure to his devotees. And then he said, the secondary purpose is to annihilate the upstart asuras, like that. So two purposes described there by Prabhupada in the purport. And then the final verse of the chapter, Vidura asks Uddhava to chant the glories of the Lord who is meant to be glorified in places of pilgrimage. And he glorifies Lord Krishna. So, we, uh, the pure devotees are always strictly under the control of the Lord. They are never disobedient. The Lord is therefore always attentive to them. And the purpose of pilgrimage is to remember the Lord constantly. And Prabhupada talks about life in the holy place, Mathura, Vrindavan. He said, I used to live there, I lived there. Wake up, people, wake up early in the morning, 4 a.m. Must be awake by 4 a.m. Prabhupada wrote many letters. You must be up by 4 in the morning. And be awake till night time, constantly engaged, somewhere or other, chanting the glories of the Lord. And the beauty of the holy place, that you can constantly remember the Lord, His name, fame, form, qualities. Anytime or anywhere pure devotees meet. So we should understand the holy place is any Iskon temple, that's a holy place. Or it may even be the home of a devotee, that's also like a holy place. You go to the devotee's home, it's a holy place. And there'll be kirtan, there'll be discussion of Lord Krishna, there'll be topics, there'll be bhakti briksha programs. So we see the holy places manifest all over the world by the grace of the devotees. They bring the glories of Lord Krishna everywhere. So we don't just think the holy place is only Mathura or Vrindavan. Wherever the devotees are, that's the holy place. Right? Bhavadvadev Bhagavatas Tirta Bhutta Swayam Vibho Tirti Kurvanti Tirtani Svantastena Gadabritaha. Maharaj Yudhisthira greeted Vidura when he came home. He said, because you carry the Lord in your heart, so wherever you go, that's a holy place. It's the devotees which make the place holy. So are there any questions on this chapter 1? You have any questions? Please, Prabhu. Uh, thank you very much, Maran, for a wonderful discussion and uh, you know, so enlightening uh, class that you have given us. I, I wanted to ask about that the external energy and the internal energy acting on a person. So it acts on the same person or on the different personalities? Like uh, in case of Vidura and Duryodhana, Duryodhana was acting under the influence of external energy. Whereas Vidura took it as you know, the mercy of the Lord. So it is on the same person or it is on the different person? Well, Prabhupada does describe it as it acting on different people. He describes like, you know, Dhritaras, Duryodhana, it was the external energy was acting on him, but the internal energy was acting on Vidura. But you can also see both energies acting on Vidura, because Vidura was being, he was leaving the palace, he was going out of the palace. So going out of the palace, going out to visit holy places, not even with a bed, nothing, you know, he was going out to just depend on the mercy of Krishna. So he was giving up all his material facilities. but. It was an opportunity to come closer to Krishna. So we see both there. 
it, it, you can consider it both ways. It can be one person or it could be two people. Thank you very much. It's a question of how you look at it, right? If we look, how we look, we can look at it in both ways. We see the example of Vidura, that going out of the palace, oh yeah, ooh, that, that's external energy, but he's going to be in the holy places, you be with the holy, the saintly persons, that's the internal potency. And we can relate it to Duryodhan. Duryodhan, he's going to hell because he's being so nasty to a, a great devotee and somebody who is his senior, somebody who is his worshipable person, but Duryodhan wants to beat him and throw him out. So Duryodhan, he's that's the external energy. Right? Yes, my Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so then we'll go on to chapter 2 next week. We'll see you next week. Srila Prabhupada ki. Gorbaki Vrinda ki.